How you doing? My name is James Avey. I'm a professor of human resource management at Central Washington University. And this is a, a quick refresher, a quick training on interviewing best practices. Um, so there's a lot that goes into, of course, employee selection. Um, before you get to the interview, a lot of work that has to be done after the interview. But we're going to focus in just on that. Um, basically, what do we know that works, either from science or, or wisdom or whatever? What have we seen um, with all the, the empirical analysis that's been done that actually works in interviews. Um, so with that, um, the agenda, I'm going to cover a few assumptions really quick that I have about whoever is listening to this, um, where to get some more information if you want to kind of deep dive into the science behind it. Uh, we'll hit a few heuristics that are general things that we just all kind of know, um, and then really focus in on what I want to talk about, which is hiring for fit. And I'll describe that. It's not singular. There's four different types of fit. Um, as well as the consequences if we don't do that well, and then um, interview questions and answers. So how to derive an interview question that actually elicits the stuff you're looking for, and then what what is the format, or what, what is the person supposed to be saying or describing where you can hear something and go, ah, like, like that person gets it. Um, so that's what we're going to do at the end, as well as a few kind of basic items like what not to do. Um, just, uh, just a standard line here this is not legal counsel uh, i'm not a lawyer i'm a professor this is much more of a scientific inquiry than it is legal counsel if you have questions you can uh, get a hold of me so my assumptions this is going to be focused on interviews like i said there's uh talent sourcing that's it's where we find people how do we track that there's applicant tracking systems right when do we contact them for the interview how soon how long should it be in the follow-up, if we give an offer, does it need to be written? Can it be over the telephone? Negotiation of salary, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's all great and important stuff. I'm going to focus in specifically on interviews. Uh, it is a very key tool. You think of it like a like a home builder. It's got a tool in their toolkit. Like, oh yeah, here's this tool. This is the interview tool um, for for how to do it well. The next one I have, the assumption I have, is you want it boiled down, and I have tried to boil this down uh, as much as we can. And the last one is that you had some exposure to interviewing. So when I say something like illegal question, you're like, oh yeah, I get that, I know what that is. Um, if you haven't had any exposure to interviewing, this might be um, a bit too high level, um, but otherwise it should be certainly useful for HR managers. Um, more information, you could pick up a lot of the general stuff in an undergraduate, any undergraduate HR textbook off of Amazon or wherever. Um, all of them will have a section there on recruiting and on selection. You want to focus in on selection uh, for this. Don't do a graduate level textbook um, because those are much more macro in their approach, less tactical. Um, and you also probably don't want to pick up just a book on interviewing somewhere because those are typically written by a single author. They're typically editorial reviewed. In other words, they don't have the validity um, that like a textbook in theory would. Second place where I'm going to be drawing a lot from is called the Uniform Guidelines and Employee Selection Procedures. This was uh, put out in 1978, if you're a history buff at all. Civil Rights Act 1964 is when the Title VII laws were passed, which really influenced how, how uh, organizations could hire and fire uh, with regard to discrimination. So 14 years later, the government came out with, okay, this is how we think you should do it. And a lot of the assumptions in that document have been tested um, by what are called IO psychologists uh, ever since pretty solid... Um, Pretty solid information. A couple of journals there that write a lot on interviewing and selection. Um, again, it's high level, but that's uh, kind of more the peer-reviewed science piece. So, some heuristics. Uh, if you don't know what a heuristic is, a heuristic is basically a general truth. These are just some things that we know about hiring. We've just seen it or tested it, um, either by wisdom or tradition or or science uh, or even or even law. So, hire hard, train easy. We get this. Everybody's had to had to have a bad hire at some point and then you end up paying for it. Um, the idea here is the more rigor that you apply during the hiring process of which the interview is a key part, um, then a bit easier it is to manage that employee uh, down the road. You can also, you maybe have heard the term hire hard, manage easy, uh, similar meaning. Uh, the rigor of the process should equal the magnitude of the consequences. Here's what I mean. If you run a restaurant and you're hiring a, um, uh, a busser, there's not a massive magnitude of consequences if they don't bus correctly. If you run a restaurant and you're hiring a head chef, it's not going to be a 15-minute interview and a written job offer. 
it's probably going to be what's called the multiple hurdles approach. You're going to go through multiple rounds of interviewing, multiple rounds of tests. Why? Because that individual has a much greater magnitude of consequence for the organization. Think of it like hiring an entry-level uh, accountant versus hiring a CFO. Um, so what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna go through is a basic structure, but keep in mind that you will want to expand this structure if the magnitude of, of that hire is bigger for your particular company. Uh, another heuristic, hurried hires will always catch up with you in time. Um, everybody's had to swallow a sour pill, which I think is actually my next one. Everybody's had to swallow a sour pill. You hire someone, you're like, dang, like we, we missed it on that, we were in a hurry, whatever it was. That's fine. Organizations can usually adapt, um, bounce back from that, assuming it's not, you know, a, a kind of a really critical position. Um, but if that becomes the norm where we're hurried to do this, you'll eventually get to the place where you have a truckload of people that you probably didn't want there, and now you're stuck with them. Um, you're not going to go through a massive riff in the middle of business oper uh, reduction in force, layoffs in the middle of business operations. So, uh, with that, yes, you can hurry. Sometimes you have to hurry. Sometimes it just happens. Um, but I encourage people usually to keep in good communication with their, their recruiter. If you have a recruiter, your HR person, if you have one, just to say, okay, on this one, I'm in a pinch. They've got to be here in two weeks. Or on this one, take your time. Let's do it right. Um, if it's an emergency every time, you'll probably lose credibility. Um, but as much transparency with your recruiter. Um, so they can serve you best as the hiring manager that is their job. Uh, sometimes you swallow a sour pill, we got that. Okay, let's get right to it, hiring for fit. So, so what we know about hiring is that different types of fit actually produce different things. Uh, so for a couple of decades uh, in the selection literature, there was this idea of person job fit. That is the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the person, like a glove need to fit, the tasks, the duties, the requirements of the job. So we all said, good fit. Like, I wouldn't be a good fit at McDonald's. It's not the question, as a, as a drive through person, it's not the question of if I can do it. The question is, is it a good fit for skill sets, for aptitudes, for knowledge, uh, stuff like that. So, so this is still true, and it's probably the most important fit we need to be looking at, but it's not the only fit. Person job fit simply means I can do the job and I can do it well. I'm a good fit. What I can deliver is what that job needs to have delivered. Very first thing that almost everybody looks at, very few people overlook this. This is what we start talking about, like job qualifications, stuff like that. The next type of fit is person organization fit. Um, this doesn't predict performance so much as it predicts turnover. So I might be able to do X job, but do I fit with X company? It's a whole different question. A uh, whole different set of questions. It gets into things like value congruence and what kind of work schedule do I want? Uh, what kind of organizational climate do I want to be in? So one of the most standard boring questions that you've probably got a million times as a hiring manager is, can you talk about the culture here? Right. That's that's what it's sort of getting at. That is, I know I can fit the job, but will I fit our vision, our mission, our values, how we make decisions? degree of autonomy, degree of transparency, how authority is viewed. Some people have a very high power distance, meaning that's the boss, they tell me what to do. Some people have a very, very low power distance, meaning it's egalitarian. My boss and I make decisions together. So that's not going to be sniffed out if I'm only focused on person job fit. So question number one is, can they do the job? Question number two is, do they fit here? Related to that is, do they fit you as the supervisor and do they fit your work group? There might be somebody who, gosh, they're really great at the job. They're great on paper. Like everything looks really good. They love the company. They seem to be aligned with values and mission and all that kind of stuff. But they just annoy the crap out of you for a reason you can't really pin down. Assuming that's not an illegal reason, right? You know, different religion, you know, something like that. Assuming that's not a discriminatory reason, you probably don't want to hire them. Um, person supervisor fit and person group fit are usually what predicts, I just call them headaches, just problems managing employees. So can they do the job? Do they fit us? Do they fit me? Like, is their followership style uh, conducive to my leadership style? Personally, you can get this in a conversation pretty quick, like, can I get along with this person? And then the last one, um, unless you do group interviews, you'll have to just use your gut and say, are they going to fit our group? Will our group accept them, not accept them? And there may be some org development needed for your group if, 
if you have a group that repeatedly doesn't accept people, the group probably needs some work. Um, but these are the four different types of fit that we look for that each predict different things. Um, if you compromise, if you find someone who you love, the group loves, they really like the organization, but they're not a great fit for the job, then you're just going to know their performance might be subpar for a while and they're going to require some extra work. If you hire someone who can do the job really well and she, you like them and the group likes them, but they don't really seem to be into the company. They don't really care about you know mission, vision, values, customers, stuff like that. Then they probably won't be there for very long. It does tend to predict turnover. Um, otherwise, if they like the company and they're good at the job, but you can't stand them, you just have to know. I'm probably hiring a headache. The question is, of course, not what's best for you or the work group, but how that's connected to what's best uh, for the organizational objectives. So four types of fit that we're looking for. They are ranked in order here of probably the most important uh, to be able to do the job, stay in the job, um, and to get along with folks well. So if that's what we're looking for, if those four things, that congruence is what we're looking for, how do we find that? There's, there's really three types of, I mean, there's a lot of types of interview questions, but there's three types that most people use. Um, a structured interview means that everybody gets the same exact question. Why would we do that? Why wouldn't we say, oh, so-and-so brought up this different thing. Let's just go down that rabbit hole and chat with them. Maybe we'll get to know their personality. No, no, no. Bad idea. This is one of the biggest things out of the uniform guidelines and employee selection procedures is that every candidate needs to be treated the same so that you can actually fairly compare those candidates. If I ask candidate A about their personal life and their hobbies and what they're good at and ask candidate B what they think about the job and what they're invested in the stock market, I can't take those two answers and compare them. That's why it's apples and oranges, two different things. The idea of a structured interview to maximize validity by asking everybody the same question in the same order, if you can, by the same person. Whatever you can get same increases validity, and then you can actually compare. We had, we gave two candidates the same question, and now we can actually compare apples to apples um, and, and see who the better candidate is. That's a structured interview. A behavioral interview is a way of getting at what they have done in the past. Um, so you've probably got a lot of these questions or else you already use them. Um, and the idea here is pretty simple. A situational interview says, what would you do in the following situation? Everybody can give you the correct answer. If you saw, you know, an old lady crossing the street and there was a car coming, what would you do? Well, gosh, you know, I'd run over there right away. Yes, everybody can give you the answer. The question is not what would they do? The question is what did they do? Situational interviews ask what would you do, but they try to embed it in like a realistic organizational type of question, uh, a contextual based question. So what we do, what you do, is you combine all three of them. You have structured interview, meaning everybody gets the same questions. It's a behavioral interview, meaning you don't care what they would do, you care what they actually did. Why is that, by the way? The best predictor of future behavior is always past behavior. Right. You can you can think back to your your college days or 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 marriage or kids or whatever it is. People usually you can predict what they're going to do by what they have done. Um, and then you add in a situational piece by embedding that behavioral question in a context that's realistic to your firm. So it looks something like this. You figure out a reasonable scenario. Think of it like I, I don't know, you're running a mechanic shop and a customer is mad about what was done to their car. OK. Very reasonable scenario or customer upset, the ledger is wrong, something was designed bad, bad quality, there was a, a late shipment of product, whatever it is. On the job that you're hiring for, what's like a normal thing that comes up where you need the person to be able to respond really well, whether it's social skills, technical skills, whatever it is. Try to boil it down into a single sentence and then repeat that process. Here's where they might have trouble on the job. Here's where they might have trouble with our firm. Here's where they might have trouble with me as their supervisor with the group. You repeat that, you'll have a handful of questions. If you do two each, you'll have eight questions. And then phrase it. You can usually phrase it with something like, tell me about a time when. Tell me about a time when you were working at a mechanic shop and a customer came in and they were upset. What happened? What'd you do? If I ask everybody that question, it is a structured question, right? Everybody gets it. It's a behavioral question. I'm asking them what they did do, not what they would do. And it's a situational question because it's an actual situation that they're likely to experience 
on the job in this particular this particular position. So this is how we derive good interview questions. Think about a reasonable scenario, embed it in a behavioral framework, and then ask everybody uh, the same questions. So if that's how we come up with it, it could be something like, tell me about a time when you disagree with the supervisor. What happened? What'd you do? Tell me about a time when you dealt with an unhappy customer. What'd you do? Tell me about a time when you realized you were going to fall short of your production requirements. What'd you do? Something that's realistic in the job. Now, once you ask that question, give them a minute to think. And there's a certain pattern that you are listening for. You as the hiring manager, it's not like that question can go, any, any answer is okay, right? Like there's an actual answer that we, we hiring managers are looking for. You can think of it as, uh, as a star format, seems to be helpful. There are other ways this is, this is kind of described. This is a pretty good one. So star stands for situation, target, action, result. So when they describe the situation, let's go back to our mechanic analogy. The customer's upset because you just replaced the clutch in their car and it's not working. And they come in and they're frustrated. When the candidate describes that, like this customer came in, I don't know, what the, like we did the job right. Like, like I don't know what the problem was. I mean, you know, Joe over there, he's our mechanic. He always does great work. It kind of tells you that they're, they're not really getting what's going on, right? They're not reading the most important things in the environment. So when they describe, when you say, tell me about a time when, and they tell you about that time, what you're listening for is like, is this person connected to planet Earth? Like, can they read the environment? Can they see what's important to people? Do they see serving the customer, honoring the institution, doing their job, stuff like that? Like, do they have a good environmental awareness? The next one is the target. Uh, what we're looking for here is, does the person, can the person recognize what needs to be done to solve the problem? Whatever the problem was, whatever the challenge was, can they, can they connect? If the customer was upset, uh, the most important thing in that situation was to get the customer away because there was customers in line behind them? No, wrong answer. The most important thing was actually to satisfy the customer, probably, or at least explain what happened, right? So the target is, are they objective oriented? Uh, managers talk a lot about, are they focused on the right work? Um, let's take, uh, let's take uh, a head chef at, um, at a nice restaurant that spends all day um, cleaning. They're cleaning because they want a clean kitchen. They're not designing and preparing food you would go, look, like you're really busy and you're doing a lot of work, but you're not working on the right stuff, right? The stuff that's actually in your job that accomplishes organizational objectives. That's what we're looking for. When they describe the situation and they begin to talk about what was the thing that they did, you as the hiring manager are going to look at that and go, is there a logical connection there? The thing that they set out to do was that connected to solving the problem in the scenario they described? So you're kind of looking for alignment and then the action. Many times you'll hear people say, um, well, this is what we did. And then my manager did this and our team did this and the customer did this. Way wrong answer. We want to know that people can identify a situation, they can see a solution, and then they can take steps to solve it Right, take steps to actually arrive at that solution to quell the challenge or to quell the problem. So the action is, what did they specifically do? And then you stand back as a manager, you have your notes, you probably reflect on this afterward, and you go, okay, here was the situation they described. Here was the target. Yeah, it seems like that would solve the situation. But then the steps that they took, does it seem like that was in line with the target? Like it would logically, it would rationally lead to solution. A customer was upset about the food that they ordered and the price that they paid. I knew that the most important thing to do here was to satisfy the customer, give them a refund, whatever it is, give them a different money, give them a voucher, just kind of make them happy so they come back you know, and repeat business and they wouldn't go out and, and trash us. So the action that I took uh, was to pass it off to another server because I was really busy with three tables that I had. No, wrong answer. That action is not in alignment with that target or that objective. So once again, we're looking for alignment. The last one, the R is result. How did it end? Now, sometimes when we get this, we're in the middle of, of trying to solve a problem, situation, context changes. Um, so it may not be like totally clear, but what you're looking for as a hiring manager there is, did that person see it through to the end? Did they see that scenario through to the end to a positive outcome for both whoever it was, if it's an external stakeholder, um, but certainly for the company. 
Second, this one's a little kind of nuance you're looking for. Did others agree that it was a good outcome? Um, so if you're hiring for a mechanic and they say, I went and checked the car and the car was fine. I, the customer was wrong, so I made sure it was fixed and everything was good. Well, but was everything good? The, car, the problem wasn't that the car wasn't working. The problem was that the customer was upset. That's what needed to be solved. So it's kind of like, it's your gut call, but you're going, does everyone agree that was a good solution? Or is it just you self-absorbed in your own head, you think you solved it? So this is what we're looking for. On any one of those behavioral, situational, structured interview questions, can they identify the situation? Are they connected to reality? Were they objective oriented to figure out how to solve the right problem? Did they take steps to solve the right problem? And ultimately, of course, how did it end? Uh, anyway, that's what we're listening for. You've probably heard about this. I'll just make a quick comment on it. Questions not to ask. Um, there's a million questions not to ask. Uh, I was interviewing for, uh, I was interviewing f uh, potential faculty candidates uh, to be a professor, a tenure, uh, tenure track professor. And um, uh, a lady came in and she was about as pregnant as can be. And we had stepped out uh, for a kind of a water break. And then one of my colleagues asked me, they said, hey, should we ask her if she's pregnant? And I think I spat out my water laughing so hard. I said, no, we shouldn't. Here's the deal. If you were to interview me for any job and I walk in and I shake your hand, you know right away, you got a good idea of my ethnicity, good idea of my age, my gender. You see a wedding ring on my finger. Like you've got a bunch of stuff right there that's illegal for you to use in making an employment related decision. The issue is not that you get information that might be illegal. That's just any encounter with humans, you get that. The issue is, are you using that information? So if I am to ask this young lady, are you pregnant or when are you due? If I'm interviewing someone for a job, obviously I'm asking about things that will weigh on the decision for that job. Now, whether her pregnancy had anything to do with me hiring or not hiring her is beside the point. At that point, she believes, well, they wouldn't have asked if it didn't matter for the job. It's the same with everything you can think of, um, gender, race, religion, what holidays you celebrate. When did you graduate from high school, right? Because that's your age down the line. We don't ask them. You are going to get that information. But the reason that you don't ask is because it looks like you are using that illegal information uh, to make decisions. Even if you're not, that's what it looks like. And there's a, I don't need to get into it, but a, a Supreme Court case in 1991 uh, where basically at that point, legally, it shifts the burden of proof. So if I come in and I interview for a job and you see my wedding ring, you go, oh, how long have you been married? I go, oh, about 20 years. And I don't get the job. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to say, well, you didn't hire me because I was married. I mean, that's discrimination. You can't do that. And you say, well, no, it's not. He was horrible at the job. The burden of proof legally is now upon you. You have to defend your innocence. You're kind of guilty until proven innocent because you asked me that question circumstantial evidence shifts the burden of proof to you. So all that to be said, all the questions that you know you shouldn't ask and everyone's told you shouldn't ask, that's why you shouldn't ask them. It's not that you're not going to find that information out. It's that you don't want it to appear. You don't want it to happen, but you don't want it to appear um, like you're using that information in an employment-related decision. So a couple of things on effective interviewing, which I think we got. Questions to avoid. Yes, no questions. That's pretty boring. Obvious questions. Uh, hey, you would never lie to that. You would never uh, steal from the company, would you? Probably not going to ask that kind of a question. Um, leading questions. Well, and then at that case, this is the next step you took, right? No, nope. let them answer it. It's fine. Um, basically, anything that's not job related. So part of the, the structured interview sequence, the idea of giving everybody the same questions is actually to protect you. All those questions are job related. You don't deviate from it. You let them talk, ask questions they have at the end, but you don't deviate from that. So it doesn't even have the appearance or the perception of you trying to get information um, that you shouldn't be using. Listening responses to avoid. This is an interesting one. Um, a lot of people think it's polite like to nod or to agree with someone, stuff like that as they're, as they're telling the story. Um, obviously, you don't want to be rude. Um, but you also don't, you don't kind of want to give away your position. As little nodding as possible. If you're saying something, if they describe, you know, an answer to a question, you go, oh, wait, what? 
Why did you do that? Well, just let them go. You can ask follow-up questions at the end if you want, but let them go. Casual remarks, echoing Miriam, all, all that kind of stuff. The idea is be polite. You're selling the company uh, as much as they are selling themselves, for sure. Be polite, be respectful, but let them be evaluated. Ask the question, get the content, and then there's your, your fair and, and legal um, kind of comparison. All right, quick review. You are looking for four different types of fit. Person job fit for performance. Person organization fit for turnover. Person supervisor and group fit for your headaches to hopefully reduce them. So we look for all four. Don't, don't only look at one and realize there's, there's going to be trade-offs. Sometimes people fit really well, but they can't do the job and, and vice versa. You got to make those calls where you're willing to say, are you willing to take on a headache for a high performer? Those are calls that only you can make leading your team. Get good questions, right? Situational, structural, behavioral questions. Tell me about a time when um, and don't deviate from them. That's for your own legal protection. It's also for just validity in the selection process so that you can you know, compare apples to apples and people's responses. Listen for situation, target, action, results. Um, are they connected to reality? Could they read the environment? Are they task oriented? Did they take the right steps? And did it ultimately have a good outcome? That's what we, what we call a, a good answer. And re reminder, the last thing, um, we know this especially in a tight labor market, you are selling the firm. So might sound silly, sit up straight, smile, talk about the good things. When they ask about the bad things, you can tell them the bad things, but also tell them the good things. Uh, you want to you wanna sell the firm as much as possible. So I hope that is helpful. Um, tried to make it as quick summary as we could, um, specifically for best practices for interviewing for hiring managers. If you have follow-up questions, uh, you can get a hold of your HR professional if you have one at your firm. Uh, if not, feel free to get a hold of me.